This is a slide from Ray Kurzweil that illustrates a concept called Moore's Law, which I don't know if you've heard of before. But Moore's Law is a basic premise of computing that says that the amount of computing power that's possible to create for one dollar or one euro rises exponentially over time. And so within the next 15 or 20 years, computers will be as smart or smarter than humans. So this is a system changing incredibly rapidly. But if we take another step up, so we go up again to 10,000 meter view of change, we find that systems in change actually also have another characteristic, which is they are stable basically for infinity until they arrive at the moment where they start to change. This is a view of the total amount of carbon in the Earth's atmosphere as measured by taking the core samples, ice core samples uh, from throughout the world and at Mauna Loa in, in Hawaii. And so what you see is that from the dawn of time until 1860, the amount of carbon in the Earth's atmosphere is roughly the same. And then suddenly, things start to pick up and everything changes. So we can be forgiven as slow-changing animals for not really grasping the enormity of the change in the system when it happens at a pace that's so rapid and we change so slowly that it's shocking. And so you realize that there's actually two different kinds of change modalities in the world. When viewed collectively, change appears exponential. All of us put together, changing together, change is exponential. But individually, change is linear. So just because you were able to lose 10 kilos of weight doesn't make it any easier for me to lose 10 kilos of weight. I still have to go out and exercise and eat right to lose the 10 kilos. I can't take five of your kilos and you know, shed them because you did it. But collectively, we appear to be losing, you know, potentially, an in this case, gaining an exponential amount of weight. So two different change systems operating separately. And so on our individual basis, when we think about people, and, and incidentally, I was having a conversation earlier about book reading, and it's sort of the same, it's the same concept. Individually, it's difficult for people to change their book reading habits. Collectively, so we all, many of us sit here and go, I don't understand why if people seem to not be reading books when I'm still, you know, I won't read a book on my iPhone, I don't get it. Okay, so individually, uh, the process of change for an individual can be thought of in the context of what we call uh, progression to mastery. And so it starts by the user saying, or the, or the reader or the consumer saying, I desire to master blank, or I desire to change blank in my life. And this is a system where we say we desire to create some sort of mastery. But there are a number of discrete steps between desire and mastery. And they include incentive, challenge, achievement or reward, and feedback. Incentive, challenge, achievement, reward, and feedback make up the steps between my desire and my mastery of a thing that I desire to master. Now, there are some other characteristics, of course, of this system that you might know. One is that a social layer amplifies this progress to mastery, and also that that's more of a loop than it is a straight line, right? So I don't wake up in the morning and say, today I'd like to learn German, and by five o'clock, ich sprechen Deutsch, right? I have to do that, and I probably got that wrong too, and I, I have to do that over and over and over and over and over again. I have to keep looping through this system of incentive to feedback until I can accomplish mastery. Now, for those of you in the room who play video games, you may immediately recognize that this looks like the design of every video game you've ever played. And in fact, this loop passing between incentive and feedback is like the level of a video game. Video games are designed to mirror our progress of desire to mastery. Our progression of going from our desire to control something and to achieve it is a lot, is very, very similar to the way the games work. And so it's no wonder when they mirror the way that we master things in the world that they're so powerful at creating change in behavior. But that's not all that they're capable of doing. And that's not the reason necessarily by itself that they do it. The reason why, part of the reason why games are so compelling, obviously, is they mirror a system of change. The other reason is they are intrinsically reinforced. When I go through that process of challenging myself and getting through to mastery and going through the loop of getting feedback, every time I do that, 
my brain releases dopamine. Every time I challenge myself and I achieve something, my brain releases dopamine. And so, every time I do that activity, my brain tells me I'd like to do that activity again. Every time I challenge myself to something and I achieve it, I get a positive reinforcement in the brain chemically that tells me I want to do it again and again and again. And so it's no wonder, with the power of dopamine as an intrinsic reinforcer, that games, which also mirror our natural state of desire to mastery, are so powerful at changing behavior and engaging with consumers. But there's more. It turns out that playing a game or learning to play something or learning to engage with something actually physically changes the structure of your brain. At the University of Ravensburg in 2004, Arna May and her colleagues studied people learning to juggle. They spent 12 weeks learning to juggle and gave people MRIs. And guess what? In 12 weeks of learning to play this game, the gray matter in your brain noticeably increases on an MRI, visibly changes. Your brain gets bigger by learning to play something in 12 weeks. And they redid the study in 2008 to see if it made a difference whether you were good at juggling or not. So were people who were good at juggling, better at juggling, did they get more gray matter in their brain? No. It was the act of learning, the act of learning through play, that increased the gray matter in your brain, not how good you were at it. So it's no wonder games are similar to the way that we achieve mastery over the world. They cause us to produce dopamine in response to every level that we play. They physically change our brains. And they may contribute to an increase in what's called fluid intelligence. And fluid intelligence is what we think of as the way that we problem solve things which are more challenging. It's not our ability to recall facts and figures. It's our ability to reason and process our way through the solution to a problem. Today's children are asked to do a level of interactivity, a level of multitasking, that no human being has ever been asked to do before. I'm 37, so for those of you who are similar in age to me, you might remember playing early video games in your childhood, right? You might remember playing the Atari 2600 or going to, a, going to a video arcade and playing video games. So what did we have to do to play as children? We had to be able to move a joystick and press a button, right? That's all we had to be able to do to play a video game. Today's children, to play World of Warcraft, you have to be able to do six things simultaneously. Six things at the same time. Not two, six. I have to be able to chat with my voice and chat in text, operate some characters, manage my short and long-term objectives, and deal with the interruptions of my parents coming up and tapping me on the shoulder and telling me it's time for dinner, right? This is an incredible level of change. So games, mirroring our intrinsic process of desire and mastery, changing the way our brains work, causing us to like, constantly want to pursue that challenge changing the way our brains actually function, releasing dopamine, increasing our fluid intelligence. It is no wonder that this activity has become too fucking slow for today's children. There's nothing wrong with books. There's nothing wrong with you who love to read. And children understand the value and meaning of books. They don't, it's not that they don't get it when you say you should read and these books are meaningful. That's not the point of conflict. The point of conflict is they are boring not because their narrative content is boring, because they move too slowly, because children's brains are changed, and they are never going back, ever. Never, all right? Ever. Our brains are not going back. Our desire for positive reinforcement is not going back. Our desire to like sit down and drink a cup of tea and read a book on a Sunday afternoon or read the newspaper is never coming back. So we need a new path forward. We need to design something and, and work with the reality of people's changed desires and the power of games to change behavior. And so in a kind of cool and exciting way, we have a new framework for thinking about this. Instead of uh, simply thinking about 
uh, games as being, let's say, the enemy, uh, we now have a set of tools and techniques that we can use to embrace what makes games so powerful at changing behavior and use them to advance our desires in narrative and storytelling. And this concept is called gamification. And I want to use a description, a, a definition of gamification for us today. It is the process of using game thinking and game mechanics to engage users. Put another way, gamification is taking the best ideas from games, the best ideas from games, and using them in non-game contexts. Okay, pretty simple, wide range of options, and I'm gonna show you some good examples. But before we do that, I wanna talk about what games are not. And gamification is not simply about throwing some badges on a website that talks about your published content, all right? That is not what gamification is just about. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, if your product, service, or idea does not have good fit with your consumer, gamification will not fix that. We cannot use games to make a crappy book work, right? Or a crappy magazine suddenly sell. That's not gonna happen. Gamification will not fix that problem. Your core product, service, or idea must resonate fundamentally with consumers. The second thing gamification is not, is it's not bullshit game ideas thrown out at a problem where they don't belong. So one of the most common things that people used to do for gamification, which always makes me laugh, it's a sort of funny story, like three years ago if we talked about gamification, you know, and I'd said gamification, and let's say we were talking to a company that made soup, like Pinoir or Noir, right? The idea might have been, okay, what we will do is we will make a space shooting game where you fly through space and you shoot soup out of the sky, boo, right? And then we take the soup and we put it in our spaceship and we go to the space station and we build it and we buy the soup on the internet, right? This was the idea that people had for gamification. But that never, never, never works. That never works. Why? Because I've introduced a narrative into the discussion between the consumer and the brand that is not authentic to the experience that the consumer is having. Space is not the authentic narrative of soup. It may one day be, but it is not today. The authentic narrative of soup is Sunday afternoon with my mom. Yes? Eating a sandwich and having a bowl of soup. A rainy day, having soup, reading a book, whatever it may be, right? That's the authentic narrative of soup. I don't want to write a new one. And similarly, many of you, especially those of you who work on linear narrative content in book or other published form, you may think that the message of games, the message of this change with the game consumer is for you to recreate your narrative in a more game-like fashion, or to simply make a game out of your book, which would be an easy answer to the problem. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that is not what you should be doing. What you need to be doing is looking for ways that your core narrative, the core value proposition of your product, service, or idea can leverage the best elements of games to enhance the connection that you have with your consumer. Not to rewrite it in a game frame. No zombies are necessary, unless your story is actually about zombies, in which case, by all means. Okay, so I tell you about me, I'm Gabe Zickerman, I'm the chairman of a series of events called Gamification Summit. I'm the author of two books on the subject, one called Game Based Marketing, and the second, a newer one called Gamification by Design. The first one's published by Wiley, and the latest one published by O'Reilly. Um, I edit the main blog on the subject, I help many companies, big and small, apply gamification to their uh, processes, think strategically about it, design cool stuff. Okay, I want to talk with you about some examples of gamification used in the broadest sense to help spur some thoughts in your mind, to spur the creativity of your ideas about gamification. And so I'm going to give you a wide range of examples to look at. So the first one I want to share with you is from Playboy magazine. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Playboy, it is a, a men's magazine uh, that features female models, and so Playboy wanted to create an engagement with their consumer on the internet, and so what they decided to do was run a classic type of gamified uh, system, which is a contest, and their contest was to find the next Playboy model on the internet, which was a competition they called Miss Social, 
And so they allowed uh, women to apply to be the next Playboy model, uh, the next Playboy centerfold on the internet and get votes from consumers to engage with them to, uh, to vote on the top uh, crowdsourced Playboy model. And uh, they were driving you know, 200,000 or so uh, impressions, I think, per month uh, with the Miss Social campaign, which is a tremendous amount of traffic for them on the internet. Um, and so this is a very, very simple example. And I'm sure some of many of you have experimented with similar kind of crowdsourced examples, but a crowdsourced context where the prize doesn't actually cost anything to the creator. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Another way that people integrate gamification with types of storytelling is to uh, actually make the centerpiece of the story the game itself. So a classic example of that are game shows on television or competitive reality TV shows, right? Competitive reality TV is a game narrative in a TV setting. It takes what otherwise would be a scripted show and turns it into a competitive game. So we have uh, many of these kind of cropping up that are taking what otherwise would have been uh, probably scripted shows and turning them into competitive uh, reality TV. But the power of competitive, especially competitive television, is of course everywhere around you. Many of those shows are the top performing TV shows in the whole wide world, right? From Survivor and Amazing Race to Top Chef and uh, American Idol, British Idol. I'm sure that there's a version in Germany, German Idol. Um, give you another example. This gentleman is uh, named Charlie Kim. And Charlie Kim is a CEO of a company called Next Jump, based in New York, but has four offices, 500 employees in the United States. They do employee incentives, and Charlie loves physical exercise. So he wanted all of his employees to go to the gym regularly because it's good for the company, it reduces, you know, reduces turnover, reduces absenteeism, and makes everybody happier and healthier and smarter. So he put a gym into every office. And he found that people went to the gym, uh, maybe instead of going to a private gym, they went to the gym. And he thought, I think we can do better than this. So he implemented a simple cash-based prize. He made a little app where he checked into the gym, and he said, okay, the top five or six employees to go to the gym the most in a year will split a prize of $20,000. Right? Sounds pretty good. I want you to work out. It's worth it for us. About 12% of employees at Next Jump went to the gym. And he thought, I think we can do better than that. And so he introduced two new game mechanics into the equation. The first one, was, it, and the most important one, was team play. Instead of people competing individually, they made teams. They got together in teams and competed. Same prize with teams. And he put up a leaderboard where you could compare your score, one team could compare their score against the other. Today, nearly 80% of Next Jump employees go to the gym on a regular basis, three or more times per week, eight zero percent which is an astonishing level of engagement. And the main change that you saw in that design, the only change, was the introduction of team play. People love to play in teams, and if you can get authentic play to occur in teams between people, it can be very powerful. Another example, which is I love for many reasons, including the narrative reason, is what's called speed camera lottery. So uh, you all familiar with those speeding cameras that take your picture when you drive? If you're going too quickly, uh, they take a photo of your car and your license plate, and they send you a ticket. I don't know if they do this in Germany or not, but they do it all over the world. Yes, they do, I guess. Someone got a ticket by the looks of it. Um, and, uh, and so these speeding cameras, you know, terrible things. So Kevin Richardson in San Francisco, as part of a competition for Volkswagen uh, called the Fun Theory, uh, thought of a way to rethink the speeding camera, and he redesigned it like only a game designer could rethink it. So in a typical speeding camera design, you drive by the speeding camera, and it takes your picture, and it sends you a ticket in the mail. And in Scandinavia, where this example was done, the ticket is not based on how fast you're going, but on how much money you make. So in Sweden, I think they just gave out a $250,000 ticket um, to somebody for speeding, because the speeding ticket is based on your income, your annual income, and not on your speeding, which I think is hilarious, but anyway. So instead of making the camera this big negative thing, right, that gives you this ticket when you misbehave, like the law, like taxes, like anything that the government generally does. The way that speed camera lottery works is everybody who drives by the camera at or below the speed limit 
is entered into a lottery to win the proceeds of the people who speak. Right? Big, negative, private penalty or small, incremental, public reward. Which one do you think works better at reducing speeding? Speed camera lottery, this, one location, no marketing, a 20% reduction in speeding instantly within the first week of deployment, 20%. So much so that Sweden is rolling them out around the country because it's been so effective. That, by the way, in the US is 10,000 people's lives saved, incidentally, if it were rolled out in the United States, across the country. It is classic game thinking at its finest. Big negative reinforcement or little positive reinforcement. We know from game design that little positive reinforcements always outperform. Or another example, which you can which you can inspire you. This, since we're in the Audi pavilion, right? It's topical, but Audi's not up on the screen. This is uh, the dashboards of various hybrid and battery electric cars, and it has become absolutely positively de rigueur to put a game in the dashboard of a hybrid or battery electric vehicle. It started with the Prius, with the Toyota Prius which had this little simple game that showed you your feedback, how well you were driving. And it escalated now with the Ford Fusion or Focus Hybrid, which you can see right above me right here. And you can see that on the, on the right-hand side of the dashboard, there's a little plant. You see this green area on the dashboard? This plant is like a virtual pet or Tamagotchi. The more ecologically you drive, the richer and denser and lusher the plant. The less ecologically you drive, the browner and thinner so you must drive ecologically and continue to drive ecologically in order to cause the plant to be lush and green. And the Nissan LEAF, which is a battery electric vehicle, all battery, it has a Facebook connected social game in which you can compare the dri your driving against your friend's driving on Facebook. So you can see how you're all driving ecologically. Now tell me, this is $100 million worth of development hundred million dollars. It costs a lot of money to make software and redesign the dashboards of cars to put these feedback games into them. Why do car manufacturers do this? What purpose does this serve? The consumer has already purchased the car, right? They came in, they bought the car by the time they're playing this game. It's good for PR, you can put it in your advertising, but why do they do this? They do this to reinforce the main reason why the consumer bought the car in the first place. They bought a hybrid or battery electric car to lower their carbon footprint, right? But how does the car tell you that you've lowered your carbon footprint? How do you get reminded of that every single day that you use it? You could have a little voice that says, you're good, right? Congratulations, you're good. Your friends are bad, you're good. Or you can make a game out of it. And when you design it in this way, with simplified, powerful feedback systems that are easy to understand, that don't distract you too much from the road, right? Like the green plant example in the Ford Focus is particularly elegant at representing the concept of feedback without forcing you to like look at some numbers on your screen while you're driving. By doing so, it positively reinforces the reason why the person made the investment in the first place and is a reminder every single day of that. And by the way, it helps sell product an example directly from the publishing industry, which is probably the most interesting example, certainly in the US so far, from publishing, was Jay-Z's book, Decoded. And at last, uh, the first Unification Summit um, in New York, we had the folks from Area Code uh, get up and talk about, or sorry, in San Francisco actually, get up and talk about uh, this book and how they designed it. But in a nutshell, uh, Jay-Z, the famous hip hop artist, had a book uh, come out called Decoded, and it's his autobiography. It came out at the beginning of uh, 2011. And as part of this, they designed a game to go along with the book. And effectively, the game is what we call a scavenger hunt. So each one of the 300 or so pages of the book was embedded somewhere in New York City that was thematically relevant to what was on the page. So if on page 180, Jay-Z was talking about his favorite pizza restaurant in Brooklyn, then they took that page and they printed it on the inside of 25 pizza boxes in the Brooklyn location. Okay. And so the challenge was, and this was done in partnership with Bing, with Microsoft's uh, search engine, the challenge was for readers, the first reader to go out, 
identified each one of the 300 pages in situ in New York City and post photos of those pages to the internet. So the first person to do that won a spectacular prize. They won two tickets to Jay-Z's concert for life. So hopefully he keeps performing, right? <laughs> they won a spectacular prize that cost Jay-Z nothing to provide. But that plus the bragging rights. So, you know, for example, here's an example in this image. This is the back, obviously, of a basketball net. This was Jay-Z talking about basketball. They printed this. They changed the basketball net in an actual uh, court in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant in Brooklyn, where they took this shot. So this was pretty cool. It created a lot of excitement about the book and got people engaged with the book in a very different way from you know, just reading it, obviously. It very powerful. And another example from transmedia storytelling um, is for, um, uh, for the movie The Dark Knight, the Batman film. Uh, 42 Entertainment produced what we call a very large-scale alternate reality game uh, in a couple of different forms for The Dark Knight for Batman Returns. But one of the best was this thing called I Believe in Harvey Dent. Now, if you guys have seen the Batman movies, you know that there's a character called Harvey Dent who's a politician in the film. And um, so, as part of this, the filmmakers actually created a fake political rally, a series of fake political rallies for the character Harvey Dent. So people would go out and like march down the street with posters, uh, elect Harvey Dent, re-elect Harvey Dent, I believe in Harvey Dent, right? And they would like set up, like you can see here, as though it were an election, they set up like a table in a, in a shopping center in Los Angeles. And we're getting people to sign the uh, I believe in Harvey Dent campaign slogan, and giving them t-shirts and little buttons. And so many of the challenges in the uh, in these Batman alternate reality game challenges were designed to get thousands, and in the end, tens of thousands, 20,000 people in real life, in real time, to play some sort of game with the content, right? Which is an incredible achievement, but only possible to do in the frame of games that you might, uh, that you might create that are relevant, relative to the content. So those are just some examples. There's, uh, there's obviously lots of examples. Underlying these examples is a different way of thinking about the consumer that comes from the game space. And this is a different frame of reference for thinking about our consumers that I want to share with you. It's not by any stretch the final answer on thinking about consumers, but it's very interesting. This is what we call Bartle's player types. This is a way of thinking about all people in the world. And Richard Bartle did this research in the 80s and 90s on people who played early multiplayer games. And in observing those people play, he identified four core types of players, player motivations. The achiever, the explorer, the socializer, and the killer. Now, before I describe these uh, different player types to you, uh, let me preface this by saying two things. The first one is, it's okay if you're a killer, you keep this to yourself, you can keep this private, uh, we can talk about it later. It's not as bad as it sounds. None of you are only one of these types of people. Every one of us has a little bit of all four of these types in, them, in us. But we have a dominant personality type that tends to be the main thing that we're interested in. And based on which of these personality types you are, we can figure out what you will find fun. This is why we care. We care because if you're an achiever, an explorer, a socializer, or a killer, you'll find different experiences fun. And understanding these different personality types enables us to craft a game-like experience that will be engaging to the audience. And if any of you are marketing people in the room, you'll notice how different this is from how marketing people think about the demographics of a product. I do, we don't generally think for it, we don't have to think very much when we're designing a game-like experience about is it a man who's 35 and makes 40,000 euros a year and lives in the suburbs or in the city. That's not what we care about. We care about the motivational state of the player. This tells us what they will find interesting. So let's start. Let's talk about them for a second because they're important. So this is an image of Tsukiji Fish Market in Tokyo. And uh, have any of you been there before? The Tsukiji Fish Market? Okay, we've got like two people. All right, so listen. If you have the time, I highly recommend a trip to Japan this year. It's on sale. It's fantastic. It's very good with euros. And Japan is a lovely country and the people are amazing. Now, when you arrive in Tokyo, you will have terrible jet lag. So that morning, 
when you the next the morning that you wake up, you'll wake up at four o'clock in the morning, I promise you, and not be able to get to sleep. But I don't want you to go to sleep. I want you to get up and go down to Tsukiji Fish Market in the Shiodome District of Tokyo that morning. And go early. And there at Tsukiji, you will find two things. One, you will have the best sushi of your entire life. Nothing better than what you get at Tsukiji. And number two, you will see the most amazing achiever game played out in real life. Because every day at Tsukiji Fish Market in Tokyo, people buy and sell a billion dollars worth of fish live. A billion dollars, which is like 40 euros, but a billion dollars worth of fish every day at Tsukiji Fish Market. But achievers, achievers basically are a difficult group. Simply put, achievers like to win, right? That's what motivates them. They like to win. They like opportunities to win. They want to achieve. But the challenge of designing for achievers is very straightforward, and it's two things. First of all, in general, you in this room are not normal. And you're not normal in many ways, I'm sure, but in the sense that uh, most people, certainly in business, uh, are score higher in achievement than the average person. The average person does not wake up every day going, today, I'm going to accomplish something, really accomplish something today, right? The average person wakes up every day and says, oh, I'm gonna take my kids to school and hopefully keep my job and come home and make dinner and watch TV. Right? They don't try to achieve something necessarily. They love to earn achievements, but achievement is not their principal goal. And so if in your head, when I say gamification, you think points and challenges and winning, you're definitely this person. All right? The second challenge for designing for the achiever is that not everybody can win. Right? It's very hard for me to design an experience in which every single person is a winner. I'll just give you an example. If uh, I said to all of you, I said, okay, let's do a challenge now, okay? Everyone go do this challenge for me. And you come back, and you come back and you say, I did it. And I say, oh, yay, you guys are all winners. You're awesome, right? The achievers in the room would say, fuck you, Gabe. <laughs> right? Because that's not an authentic win. I stole the win from you because I gave everybody the prize. You didn't get to win, right? It's difficult to design that experience for achievers. This is the Shuk, the central market in Marrakesh. How many of you have been there? Yeah, more people. Okay, we would expect we're in Europe, okay. So, why do people go to this place which is quite dirty and loud and hot and smelly, where people are yelling at you and trying to get you into their store, when you can buy the same shit there in the store around the corner from here? Why do they do this? Why do people do this? Because the process of getting the thing, the exploration, is what turns them on. The thing itself is not what they're after. This is not merely shopping. This is the process of discovering this thing. It's the person who, when you say, oh, this is an amazing basket, they say, yes, OK, so I went to Marrakesh, and I was walking through the streets, and I met this guy, Mahmoud, and he showed me the basket, and I went and hung out with his family, and we had dinner together, and then we had Christmas together. Yeah? That's the explorer. It wasn't about the basket. It never was about the basket. It will never be about the basket. It's about the story that goes with the basket that I care about. This is a screenshot from a terrible American film called Valley Girls. Um, it really is a horrible movie um, from 1981. But in this picture, four young women are in a shopping center. So is this image about shopping? Is this story about shopping? It's not, right? It's about socializing. This is about socializing. Shopping is a catalyst in this story for a meaningful social interaction between these four young women. And what you find when you take a step back from most of the games that people have been playing throughout history, the most popular games in history, things like bridge and mahjong, um, and poker, the way most people play it, they are fundamentally all the same. They are games who are they are games that are fundamentally social games. The game is a catalyst for a meaningful social interaction between people. It is the socializing that drives enthusiasm for the game, not necessarily winning the game, if that makes sense. And um, this is important to note because the majority of people in the world are this type of player. They desire 
meaningful social interactions with others. That's the most meaningful thing that we can give them. Put another way, no application experience product service has ever failed because it was too authentically social. That's never happened and it never will. This is how we're wired fundamentally. And the last group, um, this is a, a screenshot from the TV show Storage Wars. I don't know if any of you have seen Storage Wars or Extreme Couponing. Um, these are two American TV shows that uh, I was going to show you a clip, but I don't know that they, they're that meaningful. But if you have access to BitTorrent, it's not that I advise you to legally uh, get TV shows, but you might find it interesting to watch one or two episodes of this show, Storage Wars. But I will briefly describe it to you. So you know what a storage unit is that you rent and you put your stuff in if you don't have room in your house, okay? So in California, if you don't pay your bill for 90 days, on day 91, the company that runs the storage company owns your stuff. They take possession of everything in your unit on day 91. Okay, so you better pay your bill in California. So day 91, they take possession of everything in your unit, and within a week, they have an auction for the content because they're not interested in buying the stuff. So what happens, or owning it. So what happens is an auctioneer comes along with a bunch of people, and uh, they clip the lock on the door, and they open the door, and everybody has five minutes to look at the stuff inside the unit, okay? But you can't go in. You can only look at it from the outside. You cannot enter and you cannot touch anything inside the unit. And then, people participate in an all-cash auction, win or take all, you don't buy individual things, you buy the whole unit, an all-cash auction face-to-face, -face, right like this, bah, 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 okay? With each other, all cash. The winner puts his money down, gets the unit, and only then finds out what he bought. Remember, you can't go in, you can't look through the boxes. You have to guess based on what you see from the outside whether or not this thing is worthwhile. They are bidding on lottery tickets. That's actually what they're more or less what they're bidding on econometrically. Lottery tickets, they have no idea what's in the unit, they're just guessing. The crazy part about the show is how these guys behave. They're classic killers. You watch this TV show and you'll see it right there in front of you. They'll say, I don't even give a shit about what's in this unit, I just don't want this guy to get it. <laughs> I will bid the price up because I don't want, I want him to pay more. I don't want it, I want him to pay more. Classic killer behavior. Killers are like achievers with one big difference. They play a win-lose game. It's not enough that I have to win, it's I'm gonna win and you're gonna lose. And the more people who see me beat him, the happier I am. I want maximum attention for my win. The more I can get, the better. That feeds the killer. So the interesting thing about killers, of course, is that your first reaction, especially if you run an editorial website of any kind, you are already very experienced with the killer because they show up on your comments all the time, right? And if you read something like TechCrunch or Mashable, you see them immediately in every post, right? So, the killer is interesting because the killer seems dangerous the way that I described this person, right? You think to yourself, I really don't want those people in my community, that sounds terrible. But they actually are really good for you if you direct them in their energy in the right way. They are your most engaged consumer. They know more about your product, service, brand, or idea than anyone else. They really care about it. And they're trying to beat it and to win as much as they can. So the goal in understanding the killer is to design an experience that drives them in the positive way. It's not always easy to do, but they're there. They won't go away and you won't be able to design an experience to make them go away, so you have to learn to live with them and direct their energy in the right way. One more little tidbit I want to give you about uh, game design that you can apply and then we'll, we'll have time for questions um, is a concept called SAPS. And this is a framework for understanding the rewards that consumers want from you in a game-like experience. Status, access, power, and stuff. Status, access, power, and stuff. This is what consumers want as a reward for good behavior. In order of most sticky or engaging to least sticky. And also conveniently for you, especially if you're a publisher, cheapest to most expensive. Wow, it's crazy, right? Because when you think about how you reward users in general, most people think that what users really want is they want free shit. 
They want money. They want discounts. They want free stuff. Isn't that what they want? Isn't that what people really want? They want a discount, don't they? They want free stuff, don't they? That's certainly how we've always done it. But you may notice in thinking about any of the video games you've ever played that none of them pay out in cash, do they? Ever played one on an Xbox that gives you a little ticket at the end for money? Uh-uh. Money comes in, but money never goes out in the video game world. And it's because video game successful ones pay out in status, access, and power instead of paying out in stuff. So at the risk of, uh, at the risk of um, spending too much time on this, let me explain my, but I want to explain my point more clearly. It's not that free things and discounts aren't important to people, because they certainly are. People love free things and discounts. They like getting free shit. The difference is that people can accurately value free stuff. So when you give somebody a free item, a free book, a 10 euro off certificate, they know exactly how much it's worth, either because the law forces you to tell them or because it's actually printed on the thing. This is a 10 euro gift card so they know exactly how much it's worth. But status, access, and power, they're hard for people to value. So what consumers do is they overvalue status, access, and power benefits. Accurately value stuff, overpowers, overvalue status, access, and power. And I will give you an example. Um, if you uh, live and work in a busy city like Frankfurt or New York or London, you may relate to this. I will give you a choice, every one of you in this room, I will give you a choice. At your local cafe or Starbucks, I will give you one of two different choices. You can either have your next cup of coffee for free when you come in, give me a free cup of coffee, or you can have a special superpower. And the superpower is when you want a cup of coffee and you walk through the door of the cafe, the barista at Starbucks or wherever you are will make your coffee and have it ready for you fresh exactly the way you want it on the counter when you walk in. And so you can just walk in, you can bypass everybody in the store. You walk right up to the front counter and you pick up your coffee and you walk out while everybody else is sadly just waiting in line. <laughs> and you don't have to wait at all, not for one second, exactly as you want it. But you still have to pay for the coffee. Which one do you choose? Now, so, the average person, and probably most of you in the room, especially if you live in a busy city where you have to wait in line for that coffee at 8 o'clock in the morning, God, it's so annoying. Most of you will choose B. You say, obviously B. Obviously. You know why? Because my time is really valuable. Right? My time is valuable. I don't want to stay in the line. I've got things to do. I'm busy. My time is so valuable. It's not, though. That's the thing. Your time really isn't that valuable. It's not. I mean, seriously, it's not. You're either a salaried employee already, and so your employer is paying for your whole year anyway, so there's no extra money to make. Or, if that, even if that's not the case, it's not like you can monetize those three minutes that you're saving every time from standing in the line. You can't aggregate the three minutes together to get a whole hour in which you might be productive. That's not your life. So what are you going to do with those three minutes? You're going to fucking be on Twitter, right? You're not going to make them productive. I know what you're going to do. The right economics choice is A. Anybody in an, who's an economist would say, A, of course, the free coffee. That's money you are actually going to spend. You were going to spend the two euros, or five euros at Starbucks. You were going to spend it. <laughs> so if I choose A, you're actually saving money. B isn't the right economic choice. But we never choose A as people. We don't choose A because we are not rational animals. We're not. Humans are irrational actors. We make decisions using our hearts and our guts. We make them instantaneously. If you've read books like Blink or Nudge, uh, you'll know some, there's a bunch of science behind this. We make instant decisions about people and things. And then we go back and we rationalize those decisions using our rational mind. But we don't act rationally. There never was such a thing, and there never will be. And the sooner we accept that our irrationality extends not only from fictional narrative to the actual ways that we interact with the world and with each other, and we start designing for that person, the better. And if we understand that, and I think it's, I think it's okay to be irrational, everyone, 
Um, it's okay to be emotional. If we, do, if we do that, if we understand how games resemble our natural process, our innate process of getting from desire to mastery, how they affect our brain, how they're positively reinforced through chemicals, how they help us increase our fluid intelligence and understand all of those changes, and then bring in some of these concepts from games like thinking about the consumer in the frame of their motivation and also in terms of the rewards that they find most engaging, we can help people individually get up across that chasm of change, get up that change mountain for themselves first.